Well, good morning. Um, it's good to be virtually with you again. I'm very sorry that I couldn't make it uh, to be with you uh, this Lord's Day, but unfortunately, work uh, has got in the way recently. Um, before we turn into God's uh, word this morning, uh, let's just pray together. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to come around your word. Thank you that you have uh, inspired man in days gone by to write your word down, that we might look at it, we might consider it, and we might seek by your power to put that into action. Lord, speak to us this morning and guide us, we pray, as we ask it in your name. Amen. Well, this morning, uh, we're going to look at a story that was told by Jesus almost 2,000 years ago, but it remains just as fresh and just as relevant to us today. And he was addressing a crowd. And this morning, I stand in, in our chapel here, uh, speaking to you, but very much alone um, and such different circumstances and this story is actually a, a, a story of opposites, a story of reversals of fortune, a story that gives a, a vivid depiction of the cost of being consumed by your own wealth um, in this life and the fearful portrait of the life to come as a result. It's a story of a nameless rich man and a poverty-stricken pauper called Lazarus. And before a start, I want to just mention two things. First, this, this is a parable. You have heard the saying, I'm sure, an, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Well, that's exactly what this is. It's not a description of an actual event. It's a, a story used by Jesus to stress a point to the gathered crowd. Also, the Lazarus that's mentioned here isn't uh, the same Lazarus who, who Jesus raised from the dead later on. Interestingly, though, this is the only recorded parable where Jesus gives a character a name. And I think that Jesus did this for two reasons. First, he wanted to personalise this poor man and to, to emphasise uh, the differences between him and the nameless, faceless rich man in the story. And secondly, he wanted to send a message through the very name that he gave to him. Lazarus is derived from Eliza, which means whom God has helped. And I believe Jesus uh, was subliminally pointing out uh, that this uh, was God who was helping Lazarus and no one else in this story. So with those things in mind, let's, let's take a look at this parable together. The fact uh, that Jesus was an amazing teacher and, and storyteller should be no surprise to any of us, given the fact that as God's own son, he was perfect. He was spotless. He was sinless, without fault. He was the perfect teacher because he always knew exactly what to say in every situation to whomever he came across. Jesus told many parables during his short ministry. They all had many layers that when you peel them back would reveal another startling truth to the hearer or to us uh, as readers. But they always followed the same basic pattern. There was a strong pointed message for those who were present, a social application and a deeper spiritual application too. Now, I want to uh, brief to briefly consider this passage this morning under those three headings, a purpose for then, a principle for now, and a promise for eternity. A purpose for then, a principle for now, and a purpose for eternity. So first then, what was the purpose? Well, we can understand the purpose when we know who it was that Jesus was talking to. Now, Luke tells us earlier in, in chapter 15 that the scribes and the Pharisees were there. They were grumbling and complaining at the fact that Jesus was attracting tax collectors and sinners. Sinners were, was bad enough, but, but tax collectors were even worse. They were dishonest, they were corrupt, and they uh, were a sellout to their own nation. They collected taxes for the occupying Romans, adding a little bit extra for themselves so that they got rich while making their fellow citizens 
poor. The Pharisees is a name derived from the Aramaic Parisa, meaning set apart. And they were the, the Jewish religious leaders of the day and together with the scribes were responsible for uh, interpreting, uh, copying and teaching uh, of the Jewish law. They were the elite, they were set apart in society to lead and to teach and, and they consider themselves above everyone else and also above reproach. They set the laws, they set the social etiquette and when they saw that Jesus went to everyone, even sinners and tax collectors, and not to them alone as the elite, this made them furious. Luke 16 also tells us that the disciples were there. So the crowd was a real mix of disciples, Pharisees, scribes, tax collectors, and sinners. Now, Sinners is, is really just a term which comes to represent everybody else. So the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No one is righteous, not even one. And this is the, the fifth in a line of parables spoken to the crowds as Luke records them in Luke 15 and 16. The first three speak of God's grace and mercy towards the lost and, and his joy when they return to him. The next demonstrates the power and hold that money has over us. The love of money and the, the desire of wealth weaves it, uh, through every aspect of our lives, our home, our work, our free time. It can distract us from the importance of our relationship with God. In verse 13, Jesus says, no one can serve two masters for you will hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Then beginning in verse 14, we read the Pharisees who dearly loved their money heard all this and scoffed at him. Then he said to them, you like to appear righteous in public, but God knows your hearts. What this world honours is detestable in the sight of God. Jesus' purpose when he addresses the crowd is to show them all in, in vivid terms exactly how lost they are to God. He wants them uh, to see they, they couldn't rely on self-defined religiosity and seeking after fine living, ignoring those who are less fortunate and expecting uh, uh, expecting that that would be what God wants from them. And that leads us nicely onto the second point, the, the principle, the principle behind the parable. And this principle was the disparity of wealth. Now, my uh, parents are very much interested in family history uh, and have traced the family tree back to the 16th century and, and even beyond. And one of our sister, uh, sisters, one of our ancestors was a man named John West. Now, now he wasn't big in uh, tin salmon or anything like that. He was actually a member of the Cloth Workers Guild. And he was very, very successful, very, very wealthy as a result. But he also was a, a devout Christian. And when he and his wife Frances uh, died, having had no children, of their own. They left their entire fortune to provide for those who were less fortunate, to provide schooling and biblical teaching to poor children. 400 years later, descendants from all over the UK and, and even further afield meet together once a year to discuss uh, family history and explore a different location around the UK that has some historical significance for the family. Now, pre-pandemic, uh, I was asked to go along to uh, one of the uh, annual meetings uh, as they have a uh, church service in the afternoon. And I was asked if I would uh, preach at the service. Now, this particular year, we, we visited uh, Caution uh, and in Caution, there's some arms houses which date back to the 17th century. They were founded by Lady Margaret Hungerford, who lived with her husband, Sir Edward Hungerford, in Corsham House. The Hungerfords were 
related to the Wests and were also a, an affluent family. Sir Edward came from a long line of landowners and prominent members of Parliament. He was a, a Knight of the Order of the Bath and he commanded Cromwell's Wiltshire forces during the English Civil War. Lady Margaret was a godly woman who believed very strongly in the reformed theology of her Puritan faith. And as such, she also sought to live out her beliefs in practical ways through her life. Aside from many other things that she did, she uh, built these almshouses and schoolrooms in Corsham in uh, the late 1660s. And having been, been widowed 20 years before and having no children of her own, she really had a passion for the young children of the area. Now today, trustees continue to manage those properties with beneficiaries still living in the original six arms houses and a further four dwellings that were made out of the original stable block. She gave her money and resources, uh, and this is a, a great example of someone taking the benefits of their financial provision and actively seeking to provide for those who haven't the means to support themselves, even hundreds of years later. And in our passage from Luke this morning, that's ex the exact picture of the principle that Jesus is painting. The rich man and Lazarus are from uh, two opposite ends of the wealth spectrum. The rich man wore purple and fine linen and feasted sumptuously. Now purple was a sign of wealth on its own. This is because in nature purple is a rare colour and it's the most expensive dye known to the ancient world. The production of purple dye was a long and laborious task. The liquid that they used uh, to make the dye came from a tiny Mediterranean sea snail and each snail produced only a single drop of the fluid that was required. Now I read on Uncle Google that um, to produce one litre of purple dye would have required the harvesting of at least one million sea snails. That's why it became the colour of choice for royalty or nobility. Only the richest uh, people wore clothing coloured with this purple dye. Add to that that fine linen, probably cotton from Egypt, and you can see uh, just how rich this man in, in uh, Jesus' story must have been. He lived a life of sheer opulence. We're told he feasted sumptuously, he had the, the best of food and wine. Nothing he desired was beyond his means. He had property, he had money, he had possessions, and he had status. By contrast, Lazarus was a poor man who was laid at the gate. This suggests that he was uh, lame and he was uh, outcast by society. The Jewish leaders uh, promoted that the, the lame or the blind or otherwise disabled were to be considered wretched sinners, the lowest of the low. They believed uh, poverty was God's punishment uh, uh, for sinners. And uh, by contrast, riches were of God's blessing on the devoutly religious. The poor and lame would usually congregate outside the temple gate uh, to beg from the worshipping well off when they were at their most pious. But this man had been laid at the rich man's gate, maybe by someone who thought that this would ensure he got the help that he needed from this man. He's filthy, he's dirty, he's, he's disheveled, he's hungry, starving. Now, in those days, people ate with their hands and bread was often used uh, not only to eat, but also to wipe their hands uh, of anything they'd eaten during the course of dinner. And the pieces would often be thrown onto the floor, just discarded, hence uh, the scraps and crumbs. And this Lazarus longed for the scraps and crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Lazarus was poor and starving. He was suffering physically with sores. The licks of the dogs may have given him temporary relief, much like the itching uh, of an insect bite. But those sores would never have healed while they remained wet, constantly licked by the dogs. The rich man had 
everything he could ever want uh, and more. And Lazarus had nothing. He was given nothing, not even the scraps from the floor. He just lay there, unable to move, unable to fend or care for himself. And sadly, this was just a snapshot of the great disparity between the rich and the poor, those uh, of great means and status within the community and those who had no means or status, who weren't aided but were avoided. Jesus then challenges this problem. The story moves on and both of the men die. The death of Lazarus uh, wouldn't have been a surprise, uh, but how awful for that poor rich man to be cut down in the prime of his life. Then just as the Pharisees were coming to terms with that, Jesus hits them with the real shocker. Lazarus is, is carried away by angels to Abraham's side. He's taken to heaven. He's delivered into glory. And in contrast, we're then told very coldly that the rich man dies, is buried and finds himself in a place of, of death, Hades, torment in hell. Now, this would have this would have sent shockwaves through the crowd that were gathered around. The wealth of the rich man had not secured his place in heaven. Money and status did not buy eternal spiritual blessings in heaven. And sickness and poverty did not find eternal punishment in hell. Surely there was some mistake, they would say. The rich man calls to Abraham and says, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am in anguish in these flames. Surely Abraham will put things right. But no, Abraham merely responds, son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted and Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here being comforted and you are in anguish. Abraham, Abraham says to him, there's no mistake. Both men are exactly where God intended them to be. The rich man had everything his heart could desire, yet never spared a thought for Lazarus or anyone else, even God. He had his good things in this life while others suffered. The principle Jesus describes here for then and for now is that we can't live our lives focused solely on ourselves, on our own wealth, on our own comfort and status. We cannot live our lives in a self-centred fashion, ignorant or, or blinkered to the plight of those around us, be they the other side of the world or laid at our gate. Now, we in the UK often think uh, that we're much better off than other countries, and, and we certainly are in so, so many ways. We hear people talk uh, and, and use terms like advanced civilization or developed world, and they're banded around to describe the West. Yet poverty is no longer exclusively for third world countries, if you like. We can no longer uh, restrict our exposure to such plight to, to children in need or, or Red Nose Day once a year, or TV advertisements by the, the Red Cross or other charities, choosing maybe to, to turn them off or, or put them on mute or, or go and put the kettle on at that precise moment just to avoid having to see it. We cannot ignore the fact that today there are more food banks operating in UK towns and cities than ever before. There is great need in this world and every society of, of every nation is touched by it in some form, to some lesser or greater degree. But what are we doing to show love to those in need today? What are you doing, however small, to help someone in greater need than you today? What am I doing to meet the needs of those who are less fortunate today? What can we all do for someone in need tomorrow that we didn't do today? Now, please don't misunderstand me. 
loving others, showing kindness to someone, giving to uh, charities or to the work of the church or to a homeless shelter. These are wonderful things to do, but they will not get you right with God. The Pharisees knew that to give alms to the poor, to the, to the synagogue, um, was, was a good thing, and, and, but they did it out of religious adherence. They gave because they were told to and that they believed that this would buy them some good graces with God. And that's completely wrong. And we see what God has already done for each one of us, how he blesses us and he provides for us and, and our every need then we should gladly give back out of our abundance to help those that, uh, wh whose needs uh, are uh, less fortunate than ourselves. We're not blessed because we give or do good. We give and do good because we have been blessed. The Pharisees had taken completely out of context what Moses had said to their ancestors on Mount Sinai. He said, to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to keep his commandments, decrees and laws. And then you will live and increase and the Lord your God will bless you. Deuteronomy 30 verse 16. In verse 28 of our passage, the rich man pleads with Abraham to, to send Lazarus to warn his family, begging that they be told the truth of the torment that was to come. And Abraham responds saying, Moses and the prophets have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. And the rich man says, no, but if someone sent uh, to them from the dead, then they will repent of their sins and turn to God. And Abraham delivers this stern warning in verse 31. If they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Now this is to stress how the rich man's plea will be fruitless, but it also points to Jesus' very own uh, resurrection from the dead and the fact that even though he had defeated death, his own holy nation of Israel, God's chosen people would ultimately reject him. The principle then is that we cannot live our lives focused solely on our own wealth, comfort and status or consumed by blind religious adherence. And that brings us uh, to the third and final point, the promise for eternity. The promise is that of eternal existence, either eternal life with God in heaven or eternal torment in hell separated from God. As I said earlier, this is a parable, it's, it's a story. And we can know this is the case because we're told that there's a vast chasm that exists between heaven and hell. Yet the rich man can see Lazarus in heaven. And this can't be possible. Hell, by its very definition, is a place of complete and utter separation from God. It stands to reason, then, that there wouldn't be a way to gaze upon the glory of heaven the very place where God will live for eternity with his people. And as heaven is a perfect place of pure joy, unspoiled wonder, perfect love and complete adoration for the Father, there is no way that the horror and torment of hell would be allowed to sully its beauty. So while it's a story, it contains truths about eternity. In just a few words, the rich man describes how horrific hell is. He begs for mercy. The agony of hell is just too much for him to bear. He pleads for just a drop of water to cool his tongue. The pain and the anguish of the flames of hell are more than he can stand. He doesn't ask for a cup or for a jug. Merely one tiny moment of respite is all he asks. It's all he could hope for to bring him the relief that he craves. Abraham describes how the chasm cannot be passed. It cannot be bridged by anyone, one way or the other. Our eternal destination 
is final. It's, it's non-negotiable after the fact. It's set from our time here on earth, our relationship with God through Jesus and how we live our lives as a result. But the rich blessing of salvation through Christ is the confidence that we will be carried by the angels to the very presence of God and will never be exposed to the torment and anguish uh, beyond, uh, which is beyond our imagination. Our eternal home is secure in him, an eternity of perfect worship, perfect love, where all those uh, bad things that we have ever gone through will be completely transformed into the glory of heaven. He will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying or pain anymore. Christ came to save his people from their sins, to save us from the unrighteous past that we walk so easily. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Salvation is a free gift from God to those who put their faith and trust in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It cannot be earned. It cannot be bought cannot be found by any other means. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. 2,000 years ago, Jesus spoke this parable to a mixed group of believers, unbelievers, scoffers and haters. Today too, every person that comes under the sound of the gospel falls into one of those categories and he speaks to us too today. He longs for us to see our desperate need of his father-like salvation from the ways that we're living. He longs uh, for us to take action to show love and care in practical as well as financial ways to those who are less fortunate. Not because we have to, not because we uh, believe it will benefit us, but because we've seen and we've understood the eternal promise that is found in him. And we long to reflect his love into the lives of others. It's not our light that we seek to light, uh, shine into this world. We are dim mirrors seeking to reflect his love, his light into the lives of others. Lady Hungerford, John and Francis West and countless other saints of old recognised the blessings God had given them. And they were unwavering in their mission to love and to provide for the needy. I trust and pray that each of us will seek to do all we can for those who are in need in our time on this earth, inspired and enabled by the promises of our Heavenly Father. Amen.